Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to ask if you could take your seats and uh, welcome here to the beautiful historic Philosophical Research Society in Los Feliz uh, for our special panel and uh, the official book launch for Tashin's wonderful edition of Manly P. Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages. So we are uh, incredibly grateful to our good friends at Tashin, to Benedict Tashin and his entire staff, uh, and in particular uh, to Mallory Testa and Creed Polson uh, for all of their support over the past few months. I think Creed is in the back and Mallory is here as well there. Thank you. Uh, to both of these individuals and everyone at, at Tashin. This was uh, an incredible project spearheaded uh, with the, the care, guidance, and TLC of the wonderful Jessica Hundley, standing here to the side. Um, uh, March 18th also happens to be a special day. It is the birthday of Manly Palmer Hall. And, and it was not coincidence that, that we picked this date for the official launch of, of the Tash and Secret Teachings. Uh, he was born March 18th, 1901 in Canada. Uh, he passed away August 29th, 1990 here in Los Angeles. He wrote over 150 books on metaphysics, on mythology, mysticism, philosophy during his life. But even he said that I really wrote only one book, and it was The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Uh, it was uh, his greatest hit. It was his perennial bestseller. It still is for, for PRS and helps to underwrite our nonprofit cultural and educational programming, the library of over 30,000 rare volumes that we make available for research to the public. Um, the wonderful lectures, screenings, panel discussions like this, theater programs, performance art events, art exhibits uh, in the Hansel Gallery in the rear of PRS. Um, so if uh, I have to ask, is there anyone here who's never been to PRS before? Raise your hand. This is wonderful. Thank you. I'm s welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. To all of you that have been coming, some of you I know for decades, thank you so much for your support for this wonderful nonprofit organization. Um, and we have a short four-minute video clip, a little documentary that was put together just for this evening. We're going to watch that, and then I will be back to introduce our wonderful panelists for the discussion. Dear friends, I am leaving Los Angeles for an extended trip around this old earth, traveling to the very heart of each of the world's great religions. From it I shall gain the material to complete work on an occult encyclopedia, which is to follow shortly. In 1923, 22-year-old Los Angeles-based philosopher Manly P. Hall set out by ship to explore sacred sites around the globe. He would stand at the feet of the Sphinx, climb the Great Wall, and bathe in the light of Sufi holy men. Returning home, Hall set out to write his magnum opus, a massive compendium of philosophy and myth entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It is a volume to be used in interpreting the philosophic, scientific, and religious allegories of the ancient and modern worlds. This book has a definite message for those in every walk of life who are interested in the deeper problems of their divine origin and destiny. First published in a limited edition of only 500 in 1928, Secret Teachings is a wonder to behold a massive tome encompassing an array of esoteric topics and featuring vividly cinematic artwork. The book would make the then 27-year-old Hall world famous. A brilliant, impassioned speaker, he would go on to lecture on philosophy across the nation 
and at the Philosophical Research Society, the campus he would build in Los Angeles in 1935. I founded PRS for the purpose of assisting thoughtful persons to live more graciously and constructively in a confused and troubled world. Built by architect Robert Stacy Judd to resemble a Mayan temple, the space included an ornate library housing Hall's treasure trove of rare books and art. Unique among his contemporaries, Hall would utilize his charismatic persona as a conduit, remaining always an enthusiast, never a guru. His enduring conviction was that philosophy provided the true path to redemption. Enlightenment for Hall arrived only with the understanding of oneself. He would go so far as to dedicate the secret teachings of all ages to the rational soul of the world. Perhaps one of the most comprehensive encyclopedic volumes ever created, Hall's masterpiece is now presented in a new and expansive box set, featuring never before seen imagery, fine art prints, and an informative companion guide, this expanded edition of The Secret Teachings of All Ages brings Hall's original vision back to vivid life. Hall's work offers a potent reminder of his own enduring belief that knowledge and philosophy will do nothing less than save the world. Philosophy reveals our kinship with the all. It lifts us from a taxpayer on a whirling atom to a citizen of the cosmos. To live in the world without becoming aware of the meaning of the world is like wandering about in a great library without touching the books. Only philosophy can teach us to be born well, to live well, to die well, and in perfect measure, to be born again. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to mention that there will be a reception afterwards in the courtyard with music and uh, wonderful digital light projections by Chris Holmes of Fascinated by Everything. We'd like to thank Chris enormously for his participation and also like to thank um, our donors and sponsors, uh, Gia and Misha's Kind Foods. Uh, for uh, the wonderful donation to the reception. Um, and I'd also like to mention, of course, the bookstore will be open. We do have this beautiful edition for sale, along with uh, John Augustus Knapp Prince, and of course, many, many other books written by Manly P. Hall afterwards. Um, it is my great pleasure now to introduce to you our panelists. Um, Matthew Weiner is a television writer, producer, and director, the creator and showrunner of the Emmy and Golden Globe winning series Mad Men. Weiner's credits also include writer and executive producer on a little known series called The Sopranos. Will you please join me in welcoming Matthew Weiner. Four-time Grammy winner, James Fauntleroy is perhaps best known for co-writing Bruno Mars' Grammy-winning album, 24K Magic, including the 10-time platinum, That's What I Like, nine Chris Brown songs, 25 Justin Timberlake songs, 12 Rihanna songs, five Beyonce songs, and On the Run with Jay-Z, and featuring on songs with Drake, Big Sean, Kendrick Lamar, 
Jay Cole, Nass, Travis Scott, ASAP, Rocky, and more. Basically everyone in the music industry. James Fauntleroy. Melinda Lee Holm is a writer and tarot scholar. She is author of the books Tarot of Tales, Elemental Power Tarot, and Your Magical Year, as well as co-author of Divine Your Dinner and creator of Melinda Lee Holm Beauty. She has been featured in Vogue, In Style, WWD, Condé Nast Traveler, and The Hollywood Reporter. Please join me in welcoming Melinda Lee Holm to the stage. Stephen Reedy is a contributing scholar here at PRS, bringing a relatable approach to exploring the basics of symbolism and comparative philosophy. His other life is in the film and advertising industries where he has worked with companies including Masterclass, Blumhouse, and Warner Brothers. One of our favorite uh, speakers and presenters here at PRS, Mr. Stephen Reedy. Nick Taylor is the designer of Tashin's The Secret Teachings of All Ages and the multi-volume Library of Esoterica series and co-founder of Thunderwing, an LA-based multidisciplinary studio formed in 2007 by Nick and J.B. Taylor. Collaborating on a diverse array of projects, Thunderwing creates branding and design for film publishing, fashion, mood, uh, food, music, and interior design. Please join me in welcoming Nick Taylor of Thunderwing. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the, the, the passionate flame and creative force behind uh, the, the beautiful edition of the Secret Teachings that we're launching and celebrating here tonight, as well as the, the creator and creative force uh, for Tashin's Library of Esoterica series, amazing books, which we, we have all of them, including the most recent one, Plant Magic. For sale, Jessica Hundley is the editor. <laughs> she is the editor of Tashin Secret Teachings and the Library of Esoterica. She's an author, filmmaker, and journalist. She has written for Vogue, Rolling Stone, and the New York Times, and has authored books on artists including Dennis Hopper, David Lynch, and Graham Parsons, wonderful Graham Parsons book. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Hundley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis, Kelly, the staff at the Philosophical Research Society for hosting us and for being the sort of guides of this incredible space, a, a true LA treasure uh, open to the public. This place that Manley built to share ideas and to talk about philosophy, religion, myth, um, and it's so exciting to be here to bring the book that he considered his magnus, magnum opus back into the world in the way that he really had initially intended. Uh, after our panel, I will, uh, everyone should go into the library. You can see the original edition of the book and then the new edition of the book. Uh, but first of all, happy birthday, Manly P. Hall. Yeah. <laughs> what an incredible legacy to have such an incredible, uh, very diverse people who have been touched by Manley's writings. Um, we have an incredible panel here tonight because of Manley's incredible legacy of work and wisdom that he put out into the world. So uh, I think I just would like to start with maybe each of you speaking a little bit about when you first uh, sort of came across Manley's work or philosophy in general, sort of when you sort of became aware of this, this kind of thinking, and particularly Manley's work, so. Should I go? Yeah. I, I'll be brief, but 
I mean, I had, I had heard of this place um, just through friends, and I sort of, I was like a little bit wary of it, but then once this um, project started um, getting to come, well, I mean, it really started when we were researching the Library of Esoterica books. So starting with tarot and astrology and so on, we would come here several times throughout the research and image finding process and like just feeling what this place is about. You know, it's the fact that the, the sort of never the guru idea, the sort of the uh, non-dogmatic nature of sharing all these ideas, I think is what makes it so perennially um, magnetic and why we all keep coming back here and knowing that that library is there and what, you know, you just walk around and you're like, oh my God, I mean, any one of these books would be like a month, you know, just, it just to take in all the, all the knowledge. So I think this idea of sharing philosophy in a non-dogmatic way is really um, timeless and especially um, important and potent right now that we can uh, enjoy it uh, sort of without fear the, of the rational soul yeah. of the world right. needs it needs some rationality um, all right so from as early as I could remember there's one mystery I've been obsessed about and that is why do we have a creative urge or why did I have a creative urge as a little kid because art is not pleasant. I always had this need to do art, sculpting, filmmaking. I'm talking, I'm like five here. And I'm like, this is not fun. This is horrible. I hate myself, yet I keep, uh, I hate the product. Well, sometimes I like the product, but why do I keep doing this? And also, why am I actually satisfied by doing this thing that creates so much hardship? And then by exploring the question, what is creativity, especially as the internet came to be and whatnot, I went down the rabbit hole. And then some of the, the deepest analysis of creativity would be uh, spirituality and religion and mysticism and so forth. But it was very difficult to find anyone speaking of that rationally, reasonably, grounded, something that doesn't sound like a crazy person who wants to charge me money at the end of it. <laughs> and, and, I give, and I give my whole life to them at the end. So, so I came across Manly Hall, and I'm like, oh, oh, this, this fella like Joseph Campbell and folks like that, he's a normal person. And, and he's speaking clearly and concisely. I was a fan of his books. And then one day, years after being into his stuff, I close a book cover and it says, published at the Philosophical Research Society. And it was like one in the morning. And I go, that's like two blocks away. <laughs> so the next morning, I text a couple friends, if I die, send the police to this location. <laughs> and I just walk in here. This is about 12 years ago. And, uh, uh, and it's become a, a really great center of gravity for exploring the various ideas, especially symbolism, which I'm sure we could talk about in here. But that's, that's, that's my origin story of, of coming here. What is creativity, and why do we put up with it? Which everyone on this panel, I'm sure, could say really great things about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not in a position to say great things about creativity right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm just in the middle of something. Uh, I have no recollection of when I first found, I feel like Secret Teachings was just always there, like in this sort of body of knowledge um, with, you know, Buckland's Big Blue Book of Witchcraft and, you know, with Campbell and all this stuff. And what really struck me about it as being individual and different from a lot of the other texts was that there's, there is, like you were saying, this rationality and this distance, you know, where in, I mean, in the tarot chapter even, where instead of saying there are 22 Hebrew letters, there are 22 major arcana cards, therefore this came from that, he backs it up and says, well, yeah, both of these things are true. It's cool. We can work with that. Um, but he separates causality, right, from, from the correlation. Um, that really struck me. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I was like, wait, there's a place? <laughs> there's, the, there's this, there's a place, there's all, all these people? And, uh, and I just really fell in love with it. And this book is why I'm married as well. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because that dude who's uh, DJing out there later, <laughs> said when we first started dating, oh, do you know this book, The Secret Teachings? And I said, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> and that was that. The rest is history. Yeah, that's understandable. Because <laughs> I've never met anyone that said <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my story, um, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but my, my, also, um, I'm sure many of you have been broke, but I don't know if anyone's gone broke, but that's how my story started, because <laughs> if you've ever gone broke, you know that's when you start looking for God immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after all those things they described, I had a lot of money and I spent it as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> and um, while I was trying to find out, you know, find myself, um, I overheard someone talking about a book called The Master Key System. I was just telling this story to a friend of mine just now. And when I was reading the Master Keys first, I found the Master Key System on the secret website, and it had like a little reference that it was that she had based her book on the Master Key System. When I was reading that book, I noticed that he was referencing a lot of um, scriptures. I didn't grow up um, in church per se, or in a religious or spiritual house or anything like that. But I was so curious as to why he this the self help book had this other book that it was based on that was referencing so many Christian scriptures, and so that led me to want to learn more about church because I'm not going to tell you what I learned in church because it was terrible <laughs> um, from when I was going to church. Um, but when I started studying it and just getting in depth, then um, on that path along the way, I found the secret teachings of all ages. And similarly, I lived in the area. I saw that there was an address on the back of the book. And I spent hours here. I bought hundreds of books. I, I found more than just one God. I've, I've looked into all of them. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know. I was just telling him it, it would be, it's really hard for me to separate my um, journey through the, you know, the, the chronological order of religion and my um, ability to sustain money in my bank account. <laughs> so if anybody's broke right now, that's really the purpose of this story. Like, <laughs> go get the book. It might do something in your life. <laughs> Um, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, I also grew up near here. I had driven by this place millions of times. Um, I grew up around the corner from here, about a mile from here. But I had never been here. And about five or six years ago, I, I, I was f familiar with theosophy. And I have spent a lot of my life making fun of spirituality and kind of um, knowing that it was the deepest part of me. I've been obsessed with the tarot. I've been interested in the Krishnamurti, but simply as a story. <laughs> um, and then I was like, no, this is, this is kind of who I am, uh, especially theosophy, because it had, I was like, these are people who are trying to use science to explain reincarnation. Like, they are really, really interested in, in reason. But it's also this whole other world. And why do I know about this world? I understand this world, or I believe in this world because I've experienced it. Um, you know, I don't think my ideas come from outer space, but I know there's another world when I close my eyes, and sometimes even when I don't. And so my tenuous grip on reality uh, drove me <laughs> to uh, walk in here uh, uh, on an afternoon. Um, in between projects and at a kind of an important juncture in my life. And I don't know if you know about the Krishnamurti, just really fast. The Krishnamurti was, was, uh, was a guru. He was found as a child uh, by the Theosophical Society by Annie Besant and by the, by the uh, they're right around the corner here. Um, and uh, at around 21, uh, right after he was supposed to be, he was the Eastern star, he stood up and gave a speech and said, don't follow me, think for yourself. And, uh, and became a great philosopher and lived in Ojai, uh, right near his adopted mother, but he, the Cretona Society, right up the street here. Um, so anyway, I walked into, into this place. I knew it was Mayan. I knew it was, I thought it was a church, but I could tell it wasn't. I saw Thou Art That, which I know is Sanskrit, and I know what it means. I know it's I am that I am. I actually think it's not as old as I am that I am. but. I walked into the library, and Kelly uh, Carmena, who is the librarian here, who I describe as, as the Van Helsing of, <laughs> of our burnt over dis burnt out district, burnt over district, she, she, I got to meet her, um, and there was someone here who knew who I was, and she walked through the library, we went upstairs, and she opened a case, and she said, we have all kinds of old books here, and she handed me, oh, this is interesting, and it was Krishnamurti's book at the fe feet of the master, and it said, published in Hollywood, California, 
and there's a picture of him as a little boy, and I was like, this is incredible. Who is this person? And she showed me the book. And um, the book became an obsession for me, um, almost a non-verbal obsession. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's hard to read, and I think you did a great job in, he, he's insecure, actually in his scholarship. He was and very young. He was yeah. 20, 24 when he, when he wrote Secret Teaching. So his ideas are more interesting even than all the sources he's citing to back it up. But I think the thing at the bottom of it was to explain that a cult, which had always been an interest to me, was not about witches and demons necessarily entirely, but what it was about was the, the urge, the non-dogmatic urge to spirit and to something bigger than us. Um, whether you believe that's inside or outside or we're the model, and, and when you read the book, you just keep hitting the same idea over and over and over again, which has been perverted and manipulated and used to subject, uh, uh, you know, used for many nefarious purposes. Um, and you just kind of say like, oh, well, so this is, this is the drive. This is, I mean, and he's before young saying this is all over the world. This is what's been inside people, no matter what language they're writing in. And for me, um, the social aspect of the people attracted to this place, um, it's, I've just learned a lot here. It is a uh, true spirit of continuing education, but internal education, so. Beautiful. I think, uh, you know, this book, this place, is so representative of something that you've all touched on, which is Los Angeles as this city of seekers, as this place that people have been coming for the last century and uh, manifesting their dreams, this sort of creative alchemy of thought and form and movies and music and art, but also spiritual seeking and not being weighed down by the weight of history, by context, um, coming here and really kind of becoming whoever they truly were inside. And I think that that is sort of the core of a lot of the ideas that mainly speaks of in Secret Teachings, which essentially the book is a compendium of world's religions, myths, philosophies, Pythagorean theorem, science, botany, and you know, these are all ideas and it's they're called the secret teachings because they were sort of hidden because they all are tools to connect with spirit but also connect with self. They're all tools for self knowledge and that was sort of the through line with Manly is that philosophy which was sort of this overriding term for all of these ideas encompassed in this book that philosophy and personal growth and evolution were the point of being in this world it's not being in this world without without learning and growing and seeking is like being in the world's greatest library without opening any of the books. I mean, that's what that quote is. So um, I would love to kind of talk a little bit about some of these tools, and specifically, Melinda, you know, Tarot being this, uh, we, with the Library of Esoterica series, the first book in the series is Tarot, um, and our intention with the Library of Esoterica is very much, um, I should say that Manly is the last quote of every volume of our series. We have a For the Seekers sort of manifesto at the end of every book that ends with a manly quote, uh, uh, just sort of about how these tools are so self-empowering. And we really want to present them in a way that feels relevant, that feels modern, that feels inclusive, and in some way without being weighed by, down by the dogma, just telling in an academic, journalistic way what these ideas, the history of these ideas, and very much secret teachings. That's what Manley was trying to do almost 100 years ago. Um, but we started with tarot uh, because it is this amazing symbolic language, almost you know, entirely 
figurative and visual language of connecting to self. Uh, and there is an incredible chapter in Secret Teachings on tarot. There is uh, a tarot deck that Manley created with the with Manley P. Hall, who was the uh, I mean with uh, Jay Knapp, who was the artist. Uh, and so, if you could kind of speak, Melinda, a little bit to to tarot as a as a practice. Yeah. Well, I I was so struck. I went back and reviewed the tarot chapter. So I'm a very good student. Uh, <laughs> and one thing that really struck me was that there's he's you know as you said he he was very insecure and he's citing all these different people. Um, and they're, they're having these big ideas and saying it unequivocally, it came from Egypt and it, does, it means this and it means this. And then his center of it, there's this passage where he says, tarot can, I'm gonna paraphrase <laughs> for sure, that you know that tarot can only be seen as three things, um, as a set of hieroglyphs and that each correspond to something in nature and number two, as forces acting on each other, and then three, as a philosophical language. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, God, he's the most modern thinker. You know, he's, he's referencing all these other people who have this kind of very old-fashioned, this is this approach. And his, he had it then, and I feel like in a lot of ways, just now, in maybe the past five, even 10 years, the tarot community and magic community is coming around again to this place of it's not it's not fortune telling it's not to tell you what's going to happen it's to kind of give you a map and then let you finish the story um, and I was just blown away that he said it so clearly mm -hmm. way back then Stephen I, I think that idea too of um, of how these tools are utilized in creativity and in, in the creative act and the creative alchemy um, how each of you kind of incorporates your sort of philosophy into your creative work oh so how would perhaps how would symbolism or how does this be, okay sure um, well the book the secret teachings of all ages is essentially hanging a bunch of here's a good metaphor for it imagine the truth of all things the epitome of life energy that which from uh, everything rose from uh, is unknowable it's it's beyond words it's beyond categories the book the secret teachings of all ages uh, addresses math symbols myths processes secret societies uh, uh, philosophical systems uh, that all try to use words and images to um, help us know this truth. And imagine this truth is like the Invisible Man. And you know in Invisible Man movies, there's always the part where like they throw paint at him or hang clothes on him, and you can see the shape of it, right? I think that's what, say, this book or esoteric philosophy in general is trying to do. We can't say this is the epitome of truth, but we could go, it kind of looks like this from this angle through this paradigm. So when it comes to creativity, I think creativity is whatever that invisible thing, life energy itself, in us trying to come out. And in the process of art, I think then the audience receives it. And then if it hits them right, then they're opened up to it and the life in them moves. So then when it comes to symbolism, there's, God, there's, there's so many, it's such a vast system. like. A, sur a surreal image, once you learn a little logical detail about it, you could start to fill it in with your own self, and the tarot is a, a masterful version of this, and now you're thinking about yourself, and it's really hard to think about li the life that's inside of you, the life that powers your mind, your body, your emotions. I mean, that's what psychotherapy is. You pay money to talk to someone to help you think about yourself truthfully, without obstruction, without corruption. Um, so then when, when it comes to creativity, there's, it's, it's so vast, I'm like lost in a sea of chaos of which thing to pick, but how about this? Because we have two masters of, well, everyone here is a master, you're a master of, cre you're all masters of creativity. <laughs> but, but because I'm a fan of your music and I'm a fan of your TV shows, we could both 
understand that what you're doing with music, you're, it's a nonverbal tool that opens people up. Yes, there's lyrics, but there's more to it. There's something we can't understand in music. It opens us up, it hypnotizes us, it could make us sad, it could make us happy. You cannot define, you cannot define what it's doing to you when it hits you right. Or when you look at a character's face, and yes, there's been script uh, to build context that this character's at this moment. And then you look at the character's expression, and you get goosebumps, and you open up and you're like, oh, oh. That power of the nonverbals we're talking about here, that is actually what, say, this book or esoteric philosophy is addressing and dissecting and, and, and giving us pathways to understand. Yes, you could use it as an artist to, to provide service to an audience. That's awesome. But also you could just unpack yourself because we're just, our mind, body, and emotions are sort of like messy vehicles that we, whatever we are, is operating through. And they're commandeering that which we are, but they're also our partner. And the dissection of that helps us make art, a very difficult process, but also just helps us exist, helps us go from point A to point B, and just helps us, and this is the epitome of it, helps us evolve. And there's no definition of evolution except perhaps what you build for yourself. Something to the effect of be more free. So that's one little thing I have to say <laughs> about it. <laughs> but hey, would you guys elaborate on that? Like, do you want to talk about how it, in, it, how it flows into music? Oh, that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hello. It, yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about that. Yes. Um, so, you know, the first, when I first found the book, I read it through. Uh, it was uh, the soft cover book, which is an 800-page book, which means you have to carry it everywhere you go at all times, which means you're going to have a lot of conversations you don't want to have. <laughs> uh, but I, I will say that um, everything that I, I studied in that book and through that book ha has had such a profound uh, impact on everything I've made since. Like the first thing I um, I worked on is there's a, a, a famous hip hop producer named No ID that I worked with extensively, and um, we literally did a project. The name of the group. Which I don't endorse drug use. <laughs> the name of the group. <laughs> It's cocaine ladies, okay? <laughs> Thank you to whoever knew that. <laughs> and um, we did an album that, uh, which I, I've, I've said this, actually I said it here one time talking to a bunch of people, but I did an album that um, each, the, the topic of each of the songs, although I didn't explain it overtly, so the people were just, I, I hear about it all the time too, it's really good, you guys should listen to it. <laughs> but um, each of the songs on the album is, is like, uh, I used the, I use the days of creation in the Bible as a metaphor for the topic of what each song was about. Um, the most popular one on there is called Lucid, and that's, um, I think, the seventh day, and there's another one called Higher Self. That's, you know, so I, that, that project, honestly, like, everywhere I go, all sorts of strange people, I love strange people, I see you out here. <laughs> um, all sorts of strange people have walked up to me over the years, talked to me more about that than anything I've done on my entire um, discography and because of how it impacted them, and they don't even know what I'm saying. So that's what, that, what you're saying, like this unexplainable thing that people are connecting to, not knowing that I was so heavily inspired by studying this <laughs> material, um, it, it proves that even without knowing it, the power of, of just learning in general. And so like since then, um, I think the most profound impact has been just like the after you start studying all these things, you at some point you're gonna start, you're gonna have to accept that everything that's happening to you is because of your own behavior. <laughs> Not every single thing, <laughs> but the vast majority. And so I had to, <laughs> I had to change how I was acting. And um, you know, in that, and that, that bringing new experiences, then those experiences start um, bleeding into the music I'm making. And then lastly, um, I, although I'm, I'm constantly telling my peers because they're all wondering why I'm doing so much better than them. And I'm constantly <laughs> telling them it's because I read books. <laughs> and um, and they don't, no one's reading the books. <laughs> um, but when you're, when you're learning all these, these different perspectives, because that's another thing that you say that I thought it, that you'll realize after you're studying this is that it's a bunch of different perspectives of, of a core truth that, that humans have believed and thought and discussed for thousands and thousands of years. And like studying that process is really valuable for me as a writer because 
there's only three things to write songs about. It's like, I'm in love, let's make love, uh, you know, and you broke my heart, you know? <laughs> like, that, that's, that's pretty much all the songs that, that I've ever written. That's pretty and much so right. I'm really looking for new ways to talk about that, and so that's something that is <laughs> serious, like, it's, it hit somebody back then. <laughs> but yeah, it's real, and so, like, I'm constantly looking for different um, ways to wrap, things to wrap around the metaphor, and so not only um, am I getting, like, actual material, like what I said, uh, writing songs about the days of creation, but also just the, the method of um, communicating the s a same or similar message in different ways is a really valuable tool as a writer for me. That's, um, so Manly Hall used to sit in that chair <laughs> yeah. and just speak extemporaneously, and I've seen videos of him, because it was the, the 1990 by the time he died, and he would occasionally look at his watch, but he, when I was starting to say about him being insecure in that book, I mean that he didn't have a lot of confidence. He had confidence that he knew what was right, probably, or what he needed to communicate, but he was trying to justify it with the entire history of, of Western civilization <laughs> and thought. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and a lot Eastern of- And Eastern civilization. And Eastern civilization, excuse me. I, Western sounded so much Both. bigger, but when you put Eastern in there, it should be bigger, but it actually sounds really big. <laughs> um, but. He said, uh, I know, he has a quote, um, I think it's, uh, I'll say it wrong. Um, it's something like, you know that, uh, it's easier for me to tell you what I know than how I know it. And I am a seeker of confirmation. I am always looking for, I mean, there's no other word for it, it's the idea that what I believe is true or what I believe is real. And for me, the nonverbal part of it, uh, story especially, I work in a completely external medium. So signs and symbols are the entire thing, but if you're trying to talk about the insides of people, you really have to do story. And story, as we know, is completely mysterious. And I always looked at the occult, not necessarily, I always felt the occult was what, was what Organized religion was hiding from us. That's what the occult, that's what the hidden part of it is. When you get into esoteric philosophy and you see kind of, I, I was raised Jewish and I am Jewish and there is such a constant retreading of this one idea and everybody claims it as their own. And I'm not saying that it starts with Judaism. There's probably people who, I mean Judaism is the religion that's around that's so old. There are lots of places where these ideas come up and you're like, well, what is this about? This is, whether it is the truth, we believe it to be the truth as human beings. And when I look at that book and I see, you just take something like, like a snake. I mean, is there anything that has so many varied responses to it? It is contextual. There are, there it is, it is being borrowed, it's being transformed, there's the snake in the garden, there's the snake, there's the caduceus, there's the, the snake that the, I think the symbol of, of theosophy is the snake eating its tail, yep. right? What is, yep. it, what is that word the for that? The Ouroboros. <laughs> like I knew that. Um, <laughs> and it was a very hungry snake. Um, it's unstopping. So you sort of think about like, well, this is cultural is this, you know, when you, when you see a Hieronymus Bosch painting and they tell you, or the Philosopher's Stone, they're like, you, you had to be there. None of this is, means what it means. Alchemy is not even real. Alchemy was a symbolic conversation. And the people really start, they were just trying to prove that everything was made of the same stuff, which it is. How do they know that? So then you start looking at the people who have interacted with this book and what their minds are like. And you don't know if it just attracts creative people or if it makes them trust their, I, I mean, that's the confirmation, it's the trust. So for me, when I think about Manley Hall, he's always saying, think for yourself. He's always saying, it seems to me. He's always saying, he's always saying don't listen to anyone else. You, have, you already know everything. It's almost nihilistic. It's almost like this is, this is all there is, which is that if you look inside, there's everything. So if you're, the way your brain works is a model of the universe, this is esoteric philosophy, and also Kabbalah, um, the tree of life, whatever, whatever the symbols are, they do mean something. You don't even need an education. 
They're on the caves. They're, they're, they're since people could make symbols. And who knows what's been lost even. So for me, when I look at this book, it is another confirmation for the way to tell a story. And I literally have written something that involves the book. Because once I walked in here, I was like, this is what I need to be. How did I walk in off the street and find my life here? Um, I knew all this already, but I don't know any of it. And actually, I don't know anything, but that turns out I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> that is confirmation <laughs> of, of my insignificance and my desire to express my insignificance. Mm. And that's, that's what I get out of that book. And I, I, I can't believe, in a way, I don't know if everybody feels this, I told you this before, I can't believe that I'm sitting on the stage, that I walked in here and I knew, and by the way, when you come here, there are a lot of fascinating people here that you will not run into elsewhere. And there is a lot of argument, a lot of discussion, a lot of people who need to be heard and not just in the comments section. It is, it is, it is not threatening. It is always a illumination. I was just thinking how easy I have it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, as a designer, it's like you just, you go like, the math is there, the, the numerology is there, the rhythm is there, the meter, the way you count things, the way you shape things. It's like, you just use it, you know? And that's, I, I you know, the sort of, the, this gets like super specific into the industry, but people that sort of just like follow their own ego in a way, it's like you don't even have to do that. It's all right there. And I mean, in that book, you just go, God, I mean, there's a million formulas that you can use and interpret and flow into different ideas. And I mean, it's, but then going like, what does a square mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is, like, what is a simple equilateral triangle? You know, we were just looking at the, the Tetractus earlier, and it's like, I mean, you can just sit and think about that symbol forever, the fact that you, <laughs> there you go. But like, you Not know, a coincidence. One, one through 10 in a perfect triangle is like the most satisfying shape. And if you keep sharing it and interpreting it and counting to 10 a million times, people keep, to, keep loving it, you know? One of our upcoming volumes will be Sacred Geometry, which is gonna be Nick's uh, Incredibly <laughs> intimidating. <laughs> That's like so intimidating, but. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, I have, I have the golden rectangle. I mean, what, am I going to have to do this? No, no, no. <laughs> this will be fine. Do I it. I have to get naked. No, I do. I oh, come on. You know, it's like a blank rectangle, and people are always like, what, are you going to fill it in? But no. It's just the... It's just the shape. That's the good part. And can I, can I disagree with you for a second? What you do is one of the most difficult art forms. It might come easy to you, but you're just ordering chaos. Oh, I'm just ordering chaos with brilliant <laughs> graphic design. You are decorating order uniquely. OK. There's a pattern. <laughs> There's a pattern of existence in then can, everything we do. Can you come work in yes. the office with yes. me? Uh, I, I 2,000 a day life coaching fee. Okay, I mean, no. <laughs> yeah. Also. Seriously, I, I appreciate the modesty, but that this that there is the, the the most spiritual aspect of creating anything is knowing when to stop, mm. and Fair. which I think of when I heard that uh, we were just talking about this uh, uh, that George Lucas is like digitally re remastering his, his Star Wars and stuff like that. It's like <laughs> it's so good. We stop. Got it. Yeah. I think people already liked it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Somebody liked it. <laughs> but that, that you and the people who work with you and how long it took you to trust that or to learn that, and you know, just like working as a director, when you start dealing with symmetry, mm -hmm. symmetry is very unpleasant for people. And it's obvious, and it's the place to start. And then it, you become the master of symmetry, right? You're, you're Stanley Kubrick, you're like, <laughs> Check this out. I'm going to do the whole movie this way. <laughs> it's moving. Um, I mean, you just, the, that language, that is, to me, other than, you know, it's, it's, it's completely intuitive. And I've, had, I've been the client many times and had to say why it wasn't right. 
or hear why it was right. And music, forget about it. I mean, I don't. I, yeah. That's that's the ultimate. Yeah, I'll I'll hop on the uh, the praise bandwagon, especially <laughs> as a, but as as someone who uh, has been working with in-house designers at publishers that are maybe not directly intuitive about their process, like it's it's one of those things where when it's perfect, it's almost invisible, right? Because it's just it's just exactly what it needs, and like. Look, I'm not Manly P. Hall. Like, my words need somebody to do that to, to get them in there. You know, your work is a, like a big bonus on top of all of this stuff. Um, but I, and I think that that is, that's part of the creativity discussion with the book, too, mm -hmm. is it's those things that, you know, it, he's helping us kind of peek under the surface. Like, why, do, why are we attracted to these symbols? Why are we attracted to these different tools? Like, looking at what's invisible and then kind of making it invisible again mm -hmm. and just letting it be the inherent part of us that it is. Like, that book is, is us. He's just, he's showing us who we are. So you don't have to try, you can just so thank you for being. <laughs> yeah. I, just yes. also, it's, it is a, I mean, this is what you're saying too, I think. It's a self-improvement book. Yes. Yeah. That's what the man was interested in. Yeah. And he's a great writer. And Jessica did something amazing, which I looked at that, where she took out the sources and just put in his arguments, basically. I would call them arguments. Mm -hmm. But they're kind of like Roland Barthes, like, like they're kind of like semiotics um, I mean, I'm dating myself. <laughs> I don't think anyone even gives a fuck about what that is anymore. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's it's he his his musings are so inspired and so they're they're inspired and they tell you how he has tried to. Imp I mean, d did I understand? Was I always obsessed with masonry? Yes. Did I like that it was secret? Yeah. But. <laughs> To find out that it is a secret society devoted to self-improvement, that is literally, you take on the mantle of improving the world. He was, he w and he wasn't even a Mason when he wrote that. It's, but it's, you, have to, you have to drink a lot of scotch and smoke cigars as well. There's right? a lot, yeah. yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of back slapping apparently. Yeah, yeah. Also. <laughs> yeah, I'm not enough of a bro, <laughs> but I like the idea of it. And I love, I love the, the garments and the, the rings and the... <laughs> the yeah. costumes, oh my God. The exclusive jewelry of it all. Oh like, my God. On. I want to I just say something. I, I, I don't know where we are in the program, but probably coming close. I just wanted to say... Um, a moment about Jessica because um, you know like it's just important just to take a snapshot of this moment and recognize that all of us being here and all of what's going on out there and the book existing and introducing it to Tashin and making that happen and the Library of Esoterica and thank you for bringing me along on this like fun amazing thing but none of it would be pulled together without you and it's like, yeah. you're Thank you. Thank you. I'm just you're a, a force of nature. I'm a conduit. I'm a conduit. I'm. I feel like very inspired by Manly because I feel uh, he was doing what I would like to be doing and what I apparently am doing, <laughs> which is bringing this amazing knowledge to the people so that we can grow and learn and evolve and be rational and love one another and see that with all of these diverse religions, all of these diverse ideas, all of these mythologies and stories and folk tales, the core is all the same. It's all that Love. Love is all there is. Love is where we are here to love one another, to love ourselves, to love the planet, to love this earth, and to grow and evolve. And that's it, you know. And each of these, each of these chapters of this book, I mean, that's that's the sort of core. And you you, you all sort of sport, spoke to this core truth. That is, you know, the knowing, the self-knowledge is there and finding the way in uh, any way you can. 
whatever is going to speak to you most clearly, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Judaism, whether it's, you know, wizardry, <laughs> uh, Pythagoras. <laughs> it, there's ways, there's so many ways in, there's so many keys. And, and with the Library of Esoterica, that's what we were trying to do. And it was very much inspired by Manly. And I, I just want to say, really, the reason this, you're all here is Tashin, uh, which is truly one of the great book publishers of the world. Uh, and it's such a great honor. I've worked with them for many years on many different projects. I brought the Library of Esoterica concept to them, uh, to Benedict, who is uh, the Benedict Toshin, the founder and owner and uh, mastermind and sort of key figure in the company. And he took a chance and, and let me bring on an outside designer, an outside team to create this series. And the first place I came to do research was here. I've been coming here since I moved to LA in 1998. Uh, have been in love with this place. It's gone through many in incarnations. There's been a lot of amazing people who have come through these doors. And uh, so I came, I started researching the tarot book, and I saw Secret Teachings, the original edition, sitting on a beautiful table. And I called Benedict up and said, will you please come and see this space? He had never been here. He walked in, and I showed him the original edition. I said, there's no other publisher in the world that could recreate this in the way that it existed originally. Um, and he said yes, and now we have this incredible new edition. And there's so many amazing iterations of the book, and the book exists in $20 versions, and $100 versions, and $200 versions. But Manley's vision really was this beautiful, mammoth tome that had these incredible images. Jay Knapp was a set painter for Hollywood. This is a Hollywood book. This is an LA book. This is how do we share these ideas in this visual, elaborate production way. Um, and it's something that could not have existed anywhere else in the world. Manly couldn't have existed anywhere else in the world, you know, so. So, yeah. I love LA. <laughs> How are you guys feeling? Should we open it up for a little Q and A before? Yeah, are you guys? Is sure. there anything that you, you, anyone wants to kind of say before we let uh, the audience? I'd just like to quick formally apologize to the muses and everybody up there because I said I didn't have anything nice to say about creativity earlier because I'm in the middle of a project and I don't want them to abandon me now. So you're all my witnesses. Thank you. They're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. The, the alchemical process. Shall we, do we have questions? Does anybody have a question? Could you speak to collaborative relationship between um, Manly and Knapp and the, what was that collaboration like? How much creative direction was going on between them? I can speak a little bit to it. Uh, uh, <coughs> essentially, there are, two, there are actually two artists that, that Manly P. Hall worked with quite a bit. One was Jay Knapp and another was M.K. Cerulean. Uh, MK, there are uh, quite a few beautiful images that uh, Cerulean did that were, uh, didn't end up in the book, but they were used. Manley had an amazing journal, The All-Seeing Eye. He wrote many, 150, is that what Dennis said, 150 books. Uh, Cerulean did a lot of those. But he created some for Secret Teachings and then they were edited out and they're actually in the companion book to the new edition has the Cerulean's that were created. Um, they, you know, Jay Knapp, they worked on ever. he was, you know, the sort of uh, visual manifester of Manley's ideas. They met early, early on, uh, and he, I believe that this was the first project, but then, you know, it was, they started work on it in 1923, 24. Manley had 
gone around the world and started collecting imagery, uh, books, Tibetan scrolls, much of which is at the uh, the Research Institute at the Getty. We have David Branfman somewhere here, who's the amazing head of the Getty Institute, where a lot of the um, more uh, rare alchemical manuscripts are held that Manley collected. Uh, and he brought those back and sat with Knapp, and they started dreaming up how to update them, update these ideas, and create them, you know, as graphic kind of fantasy novel, Hollywood, <laughs> you know, throw a little silver screen sparkle on it, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, curious, I, I've read Manly P. Hall's, Jody Willie, our good friend, had published a book on Manly P. Hall, and how, what was his, like early upbringing, was he, was he raised in a religious family? So his uh, mother, his mother, I believe, mother or father was a chiropractor. He grew up in Canada, but he moved to Los Angeles when he was 19 years old and moved in with his grandmother who was a theosophist. So she was uh, studying, you know, there was so much going on at that time in LA there was the the Theosophist. There was Annie Besant. There's there's still incredible places here if you guys don't know the Cretona, uh, the Besant Lodge. All of these this convergent. There was a self realization center. There was all this stuff kind of converging, and he she was definitely in the crux of it and had a lot of salons and you know this is Venice in 1917, 1918 Venice Beach California. I mean vaudeville, you know, carnival craziness. So he, he was in, you know, in that world very much, right, in, as a teenager, so. Yeah. Any bite size suggestions? Or we just want to start learning more about this? Because I'm 26 and I've spent the past two years learning these things on my own. But I feel like my 13 year old cousins school have yet to realize these things, and I know some may assume they will realize these things, but how do you get them there faster to make that school that small? Actually, in the bookstore, there's like hundreds of pamphlet style mm -hmm. books, and I bought all of them. They're all over my house. <laughs> They're everywhere. So I think that's a great place to start because it's like literally small doses of the overall material. There's an amazing pamphlet that, so PRS uh, still produces the, uh, all of Manley's work, uh, and they have these pamphlets, as you're saying. There's one that he wrote called uh, The Ten Basic Rules of Life, and it's about 50 pages long, and it's ten ba the first rule is stop worrying, um, and it distills his rules of living down and it's great. So there's all sorts of, and then I would, I, I, I think with the series that Nick and I do for Tashin, that is kind of what we want to do. They're pr predominantly art books first, so they're just beautiful to look at and have around and, and then you kind of can, I, we condense and contextualize these ideas in a way that I think is, it's very introductory. Um, so that's, I would, Fire books. <laughs> I would also say, as the father of four children, that if you know a 13-year-old and you just mention one thing, King Tut, just pick it, dinosaurs, you will hear everything that is in this book. They know and they forget. You sort of stop trusting it. And one of the great things about people you know, drawings, kids' drawings, kids' conversations, kids' games, and look, I'm, it's always rosy. There's a lot of, you know, the worst of humanity is also there. But there is a, there is, <laughs> there is true, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, I, there's not a lot of teasing in the book. But it's interesting to me, I was gonna ask you this, because th this is, we're talking about the spiritual aspects of it, or the creative aspects, or, or why we're drawn to it. Jessica has that, but she's also like an incredible historian, and Kelly is really, you know, yeah. knows the entire history. 
he is kind of like a um, a point in the history of these thoughts in the sense that they had been discounted and disappeared and it, it, he's kind of coming in a, in a moment of, of spiritualism, of revival, right? There's the Great Awakening in America is like in the 1880s or 1860s, I don't know what it is, but there's a bunch of stuff in New York and then there's nothing for a while and the, certainly the, the Eastern and European tradition of what was written down about the intellectual history of these thoughts, of the occult that is actually secret but written down, there's kind of no one in between him and like the Middle Ages or yeah. something, or the 1700s, or maybe. Is that true? I would say so, as far as putting it all in one place in this way and making it accessible in this way, which is... And he went and found all the sources, and yeah. that, right? Is that, that's yeah. what I heard. Yeah. I mean, that whole collection, which... Afterwards, I, I, everyone should definitely go into the library where you'll see the, the older book and the new book. But that whole collection, I mean, this is just this amazing collection of books that he collected over the years. And all of this knowledge and just housing it, sharing it. Uh, yeah, it's really... Okay, can I suggest the book for your... Uh, who's your relative? Right. I mean, I mean, uh, a a asterisks to anything I say. If anyone told me to do anything when I was 13, I would do the opposite for about five years. So, but but that being said, um, there's there's, but there's um, first there's Initiates of the Flame by Manly P. Hall. It's a very short book. It's like seven essays. That's sort of a, a smoothie of concepts of what is the fire of life. How about that? Uh, very short. Very short. Um, another, and not Manly Hall, is the Kabbalion, which is basic hermetic rules. And when you read that, especially for a 13-year-old about to enter the wildness of puberty and what is the world, it actually lays out, well, what are the general patterns? What are, what's the order, generally, of existence that you will decorate your, with your unique expression? And, and the third, and this is, this is what's so tricky about esoteric philosophy, we're all built different. Some of us will lean towards the more mathematical Pythagoras angles of philosophy. Some of us will like the complexities of, say, the Kabbalah tree of life. Some of us will love the symbolism of, of Kali standing on Shiva and what, what that means. Thus, maybe the one skeleton key would be images, and, and Tashin has a lot of, Library of Esoterica has great uh, collections of these images, but sometimes looking at these images, and esoteric images are surreal. They're captivating, and you go, how could any of this make sense, though? There's like a chicken with snake for legs. There's like, there's like weird half creature, half human things. And then you go, wait, uh, this wasn't made by a crazy person. This was made by generally someone with intention. <laughs> of course, if they're doing it intentionally, sometimes people are just surreal. But when people are making esoteric art, they're generally going, OK, I'm going to pull some resources from a consensually agreed upon uh, um, a collection of ideas of, say, snake symbolism. And it's real easy to unpack snake symbolism because just look at what snakes do. Oh, oh, this image has snakes. Okay, what do snakes do? Well, they're, or they're poisonous or venomous, depending what kind of snake. Well, that is dangerous unless used correctly. Oh, then it becomes medicine. Oh, well, what does the snake represent? Oh, it generally represents the energy of the physical inside of you. Therefore, the energy of the physical inside of you can be a poison or a medicine if used correctly. So if you show a 13-year-old these surreal images and they're just really like, damn, I'm really into this Shiva image, or I'm really into this um, element, uh, with, uh, controlling the elementals. And then, and then uh, if, if they're so inspired to keep digging, well, what might it mean? You dig into some of the context. Tarot, again, is the masterful version of this. Um, alchemy. Every uh, spiritual system generally has its surreal artwork. It's crazy. It's like death metal album covers. <laughs> but once you unpack it just a little bit, you're like, <laughs> this is psychology itself told more brilliantly than Jung, Freud, Adler, Viktor Frankl, all combined. And it's in an image. You know, they say an image is worth a, a, a thousand words. The, like, esoteric artwork images are like, oh, okay, here's all of your emotions and like 50 years of conversation, one image. So if you show your 13-year-old family members just some imagery, esoteric philosophical imagery, again, a lot in the Toshin Library of Esoterica books, that might be your entry point. 
And also, you don't got to, 13 year olds don't like reading necessarily, <laughs> so. <laughs> so my answer for everything is get a Matero deck. You're the, cool, you're the cool one in Los Angeles. I'm from the Midwest as well. Just give them a tarot deck and say nothing. They'll look at it. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. That sounds like a good <laughs> if you tell them about the all-seeing eye and you show them a picture of it, whether it's on the outside of this book or not, and they start to see it and see it and see it and hear it talked about and see the word and realize that every single person from like Albert Einstein to like everybody you work with <laughs> it, you know, that's, that's when they feel like they belong. <laughs> Connect it to their lived experience, and they'll be yeah. like, what, what, what? It's everywhere. Do we have any more questions? I would, uh, yeah? I was in Matthew, are you able to talk about your project that was based on the secret teaching? I'm trying to sell it right now. So you we're going to have it. a ceremony. I'm going to sit in the chair for a second. Because <laughs> I, you know, superstition is the enemy of wisdom. So I'm going to sit in that chair for a minute. <laughs> um, and basically, I wanted to write about um, that moment when you realize you're connected, you know, to everything. And it doesn't make you, it used to scare me to see all the coincidences, and I would discount them, especially when you're writing a story. You know, someone tell you something amazing, you know. Somebody bought uh, their daughter, uh, their daughter bought a book on eBay that she needed for college, Emily Dickinson, and she goes to Oberlin. She bought it on eBay, the book showed up, and it had her grandmother's name in it. And they're like, oh, isn't that incredible? And I'm like, I can't use that, because the audience knows I can say anything, so why don't I just make it a coincidence? And then I was like, at a certain point, when you open yourself up to it, there's, there are no coincidences. The conversation is constant. The contact is constant. Your focus is constant. You're, dare I say, spiritually connected to, we all, I can tell you right now, all these people feel like they know each other. We all feel like we know each other, and it's not just because Jess, we know Jessica. That is not a coincidence that this happened. So what happens when someone starts to admit that? And in the story, it's basically there's a, there's a murder mystery that, uh, where all of the clues are coincidences. But of course, everything can be explained, but of course, it's still a mystery. So it's basically really funny, and <laughs> it's, got, <laughs> it's a film noir sort of thing about a writer, and, and, um, and it, it features them finding out about this book and they stop the car and they look and they're in front of the PRS and uh, and I literally was like I would never ever have written that before uh, but it happened to me so yeah. so hopefully I'll be here when, when we after we make it but. so I am going to invite everyone into the second half of the evening but first I would like to bring up Chris Holmes who has created an incredible visual experience outside for us. Um, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about what people are about to witness? And, and thank you all for, for listening. Thank you all for being here and for adding your incredible wisdom and enthusiasm and talent to the mix. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And thank you for thank bringing you the so book much. back. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the book back. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Holmes. Thanks, Jess. Uh, it's funny being here tonight because I actually connected with Jess doing another Teshin project that she was doing. And I was telling her about a project that I'm working on that I'm going to share a little bit with you guys outside that was based a lot on the secret teachings. And uh, over the pandemic, I started making art to use screens and technology to connect you to the unitive state of consciousness at a time when every screen is triggering anxiety and fight or flight. I tried to find ways to, to visually put you in a state of mind. So I was making these headset pieces uh, for VR, and it I was making these physical light sculptures and making massive kaleidoscopes and stuff. And uh, you know, over the course of the pandemic, um, I developed a whole bunch of these and was doing remixes of Manly P. Hall lectures, creating live score with Oliver Krauss, who's here with me, who's going to be playing cello in the lobby, or in the uh, courtyard. And, and I found that you know, all of the 
all of the stuff that I was trying to communicate is stuff that's in secret teachings and it's stuff that's in Manley's lectures. But uh, trying to find ways to, to get people out of that state of fight or flight and connect with wonder and joy and created a company called Fascinated by Everything. I have hypomania, my brain's always going off like fireworks. And I could be in a stuck in a state of worry or I could be stuck in a state of wonder. And uh, so the last uh, couple of years, I've started creating some artwork where I'm, uh, we're gonna have a dome in LA next year uh, by the SoFi Stadium. It's a 100 foot screen uh, at 12K and uh, they're gonna be playing my experiences there. But uh, what you'll see outside are collaborations I did with a laser artist, and so it's all physical laser light sculptures. And then I took two lectures, uh, two of my favorite Memory P. Hall lectures, and used uh, some new AI stuff and took the noise out of them. So I'm gonna do remixes with live score uh, to the Secret Teachings lecture and the Holy Grail lecture, and uh, we'll just have some fun with it. But uh, you know, I think that you guys all hit on this point that it's about connecting to that unit of state and you know whether it's through creativity or a religious experience or just a connection with another person you know we're in a time right now where everything is triggering that ego and it's so important to find non-egoic ways to uh, to kind of experience art and that's what the secret teachings has always really been about for me so um, we're gonna get weird and it'll be <laughs> mellow um, but uh, I'm really stoked to be here it's an honor that's the guy <laughs> That's the guy who asked me about the book, by the way. So there, are, there are drinks. There will be drinks. Please go into the library, look at the books, look at the secret teachings books, talk to one another. You're all here for a reason. Dear friends, I am leaving Los Angeles for an extended trip around this old earth, traveling to the very heart of each of the world's great religions. From it, I shall gain the material to complete work on an occult encyclopedia, which is to follow shortly. In 1923, 22-year-old Los Angeles-based philosopher Manly P. Hall set out by ship to explore sacred sites around the globe. He would stand at the feet of the Sphinx, climb the Great Wall, and bathe in the light of Sufi holy men. Returning home, Hall set out to write his magnum opus, a massive compendium of philosophy and myth entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It is a volume to be used in interpreting the philosophic, scientific, and religious allegories of the ancient and modern worlds. This book has a definite message for those in every walk of life who are interested in the deeper problems of their divine origin and destiny. First published in a limited edition of only 500 in 1928, Secret Teachings is a wonder to behold a massive tome encompassing an array of esoteric topics and featuring vividly cinematic artwork. The book would make the then 27-year-old Hall world famous. A brilliant, impassioned speaker, he would go on to lecture on philosophy across the nation and at the Philosophical Research Society, the campus he would build in Los Angeles in 1935. I founded PRS for the purpose of assisting thoughtful persons to live more graciously and constructively in a confused and troubled world. Built by architect Robert Stacy Judd to resemble a Mayan temple, the space included an ornate library housing Hall's treasure trove of rare books and art. Unique among his contemporaries, Hall would utilize his charismatic persona as a conduit, remaining always an enthusiast, never a guru. His enduring conviction was that philosophy provided the true path to redemption. Enlightenment for Hall arrived only with the understanding of oneself. He would go so far as to dedicate the secret teachings of all ages to the rational soul of the world. Perhaps one of the most comprehensive encyclopedic volumes ever created, Hall's masterpiece is now presented in a new and expansive box set, featuring never before seen imagery, fine art prints, and an informative companion guide, this expanded edition of The Secret Teachings of All Ages brings Hall's original vision back to vivid life. Hall's work offers a potent reminder of his own enduring belief that knowledge and philosophy will do nothing less than save the world. 
philosophy reveals our kinship with the all. It lifts us from a taxpayer on a whirling atom to a citizen of the cosmos. To live in the world without becoming aware of the meaning of the world is like wandering about in a great library without touching the books. Only philosophy can teach us to be born well, to live well, to die well, and in perfect measure to be born again.